the Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmitz. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Welcome to it, Weekend Editions here. It's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. Mr. Mark Cranach on the bottom of your screen, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt. Hope everyone's uh, doing well. Two weeks from today, we'll be at the single barrel as we Ooh. get ready for Nebraska and Nebraska with the <laughs> spring game. So Who are you rooting for be, that day? <laughs> wh- whoever covers the number. But uh, Cranach, before we just went live, I heard that big old gsh, crack. Yeah. And it looked like it was a Bud Light or a Coors Light, but I'm sure it's a Fresca? No, it's water? a it's bubbly. It's bubbly, bubbly, bubbly sparkling water, uh, <laughs> co- <laughs> coconut and pineapple, man. Feeling uh-huh. fresh this morning. There, there do, you, do, y'all, do y'all do the, the sparkling water? Is that a thing? Chris, do you do that? Uh, Elijah, you do that? I don't know. No. No, no. Have you tried it? Yeah. This is just all straight vodka every morning, all morning. Hmm. Do you – okay, well, of course. That's par for the course for you, which is great. It's why we love you, you know. You're leaving Las Vegas ways. The Now, but why not Why not sparkling water? Because I got turned on to it probably like no, 10, 11 years ago and was like, you know what? I like that. It's, it's, like, the, it's like water, but it's also got the refreshing bubbliness of like a – you know, a pop or something like that. You don't have to. It, it what la- would you it compare lacks, it to? It lacks the refreshing flavor of like soda, though, is the problem. The flavors are usually subtle. Yeah. 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 This one, you can taste some coconut in there, mm-hmm. but it's just, it's just kind of chilling. It's just background. Now, if you drink too much of it, apparently it calcifies your bones. Like if you do it exclusively. Aren't your bones Catch. already calcium? Yeah, well, I guess they get over calcified. What am I, a doctor? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I'm just saying. Uh, I think that's what happens. The so. sparkling bubbly you're referring to mm-hmm. is the what of college football offenses. Ooh. Is it the triple option? Is it the air raid? Is it the Chip Kelly? It is, it is the. Is it the uh, the. Sadder feel. I mean, it's underrated in some circles. Okay. Right. If that sh- if that starts to get us to some offensive stuff, I I was going Scott Frost because like looks so really good. For, look looks really good from the outside, and then you you dive a little deeper, and you're like, this and you is- taste it. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> a, little, a little bland, actually. <laughs> don't say I'm drinking Frost. It, it it doesn't it doesn't it perform. Weird. Yeah, I, I, or. I used yeah. to like sparkling water. It isn't water. quite what oh, you yeah. hoped for. You go, no, like, okay. I, I can That's... see how people appreciate this, but it's not quite what I hoped for. That works. Yeah. Well, well, I encourage you all to try it, though. Okay. I, I encourage you all to try it again. If you've tried it once, you know what you're getting into now. You want a little substance in your belly, right? But you don't want all the calories in the guilt, all right? That's, uh, I just think you all should try it. We should talk about it next time. Well, we'll I, uh, I bet you Brandon will have a sparkling water from time to time. We'll, we'll get his opinion on it. Brandon Vogel going to be with us from Counter Read. Yeah. Counterread.com in about uh, five to ten minutes. The Iron Horse, Gary Sharp, joins us at 8.30. Fellas, uh, Husker baseball last night, a tough one where they're up, they're comfortable, and then – Hilarity ensues the wrong way. Our dear friend uh, David Gustafson was on the call last night. Yeah, Walter from Philly, uh, Husker baseball leaking oil like an SS Valdez. They uh, they blow it. They lose an extra seven to six. Uh, Kyle Perry had a tough one. That's no good. But uh, we'll see how they bounce back today as Nebraska's on that uh, that skid. Beer at the uh, wonderful Haymarket Park next that week. came out of nowhere, didn't it? Yeah, Jeez. there's a, a deal brokered. It's wonderful. And, Cranach, we got to get you involved with this because we know you take the your kids, your awesome kids, to a lot of Husker events. And I'm yeah. wondering if we could 
rope them into this nine inning, nine beer, nine hot, not the beer part, but the nine hot dog challenge that Elijah and I and, and Connor are thinking about doing next weekend for the Maryland series. Oh, so hold, tell me about this. So you're, you're, you're going to try to have one beer and one hot dog every inning? Yes. Well, the, the date that I threw out there yesterday with Connor was Sunday, April 28th. Oh, the day after the, the spring the day game. after the spring game. The the okay. the potential for ruining your Monday is unfortunately there. That that is the the rough potential. But I think that is the perfect adventure to get up to on the day after the spring game. In in my humble opinion, I, <laughs> I think it could be. Um, that's the, the day to throw out there. I think you could also throw out Senior Day. It could be a a, a big Senior Day. That's against Indiana. I want to say coming up in a couple weeks. That also works as well. I, that's that's the date I tentatively threw out there, though. Okay. Okay. And so, what what are y'all doing this for? Just to for to, fun because you can because hot it's dogs like, and it's hot dogs and beer. It's kind of that <laughs> that David Goggins mindset. If you really want to test yourself, you know, you you want to see what the body can truly do. You think that's what David Goggins is really trying to encourage you to do? I think you're like misinterpreting what he's trying to say. I don't think I don't think he's really saying take nine tube steaks, jam it down your mouth in three hours. Like I don't think that's what he's trying to say. We could go don't. for a run if we go for a run after. Then it's the oh. Goggins way. <laughs> oh, look at by the way, look at this bubble thing taking off now in the in the comments. Right, we got we got Vic we- chiming in first. Oh, and this, here's James. This is good. Sparkling water has as many bubbles as the Scott Frost offense has bubble screens. It's true. Uh-huh. That was his go-to. When in there doubt, go. it was like it was like Frost when in doubt pick C button. You know, mm. uh, sure. Vic, do sparkling water when I'm doing no drink whatever month to keep me from jonesing. There you go. Okay. Or substitute for alcohol. There Let's uh, get our shout outs in for the stream. Always stream the show with the Hail Varsity YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, Hail Varsity. Twitter at HVarsity Radio, KFOR, Facebook and Twitter can watch the show that way. Uh, the good one, many of you uh, are in that category, but number one is uh, NASCAR Eric. He is in first this morning. Steve is in second. Her Dizzle checks in third. Tuck, way to have you. You were on time. Tuck, Brandon checks in at five. Black Hills, Brennan. Is in a turkey blind. So he is going to go gobble, gobble this morning. And uh, good to hear from you, Brennan. Mr. Jeff Snitley, good morning, fellas. We had a uh, shout out to our dear friend, the, uh, the friends, the Snitleys, is Elijah, when he gets to Colorado next weekend, he is going to put down a commemorative plaque where the Boulder Peace Treaty actually happened. With the Snitleys, that was right after the Colorado game. That was a miracle I witnessed where Nebraska fans were cut off from the bar and the Snitleys negotiated uh, pouring rights to keep having beers uh, after the hotel cut off, said Nebraska fans. Mm. And too much uh, booze. Uh, So Snitleys, uh, good to have you. Uh, Appreciate you. Uh, And Eric... NASCAR Eric's uh, gear, gearing up for not only the Masters, but also a little Hail Varsity this morning. Rick is in. We've heard from uh, Walter from Philly. Tim says, what's up? This was right before we launched. Uh, so there we go. Brian Snitley in. Drunk Monk is in. Justin and Dion. Good to have Dion, man. Awesome, awesome. We'll get to more of your comments coming through. Rick asks a question. Have you ever loved a girl so much that she could fart what? in the back of it and you would bite the bubbles? <laughs> Dear God, what was this? That is so specific, Rick. It came what? out of nowhere. I don't even know what they're talking about. I didn't click on it. but uh, I did. I did. I just don't know. It came out of... We're, I think we're talking it was sparkling reference. water. Bubbles. That is sparkling then, water in a way. And then, well, yeah, it's bubble water, I guess. And I guess that triggered a, a very specific memory for Rick, who was once in love with somebody so much that I need not repeat it. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. It took a turn. All, all right, then. Uh, no, uh, Rick is the answer. Spicy, sparkling bubbles with NASCAR Eric. 
when, Brandon, when, Brandon when, Vogel has uh, reconsidered joining this party this morning. Vogues, how we doing? I'm doing pretty well. How are you guys? We're all have, right. We, have you ever we, loved a woman so <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not going to ask you this question. Uh, Vogue's just going to get up, push his chair in, and just kindly walk to the kitchen. I, I can say personally, like from my experience, no. No, I haven't, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of coordination that has to happen with that whole thing anyways. Like one, you thought to about it, it. Two, it has to create bubbles. I'm just thinking about it now. Like it just, <laughs> I'd never pondered it before, but like there's logistics involved here <laughs> that are just like, now. you got to think about what you're feeding her a few hours before. It's a whole thing. Uh, so Brandon, we were starting talking about uh, just random beer, sparkling beer, water, sparkling water. Are, do you partake? Do you not partake? Um, I do partake. Um, I don't. It's it's a weird thing. Like I don't feel like I particularly like any of the flavors of La Croix, yeah. um, but I'll drink them because like they're around. Um, yeah. Spindrift, the half tea, half lemonade, is probably the best one. There you go. But it's also like more expensive than La Croix. So, mm-hmm. but the real treat I found is Topo Chico. I'm a Topo Chico chick. Uh, uh- <laughs> I feel like it's aggressively carbonated. Which is yeah. which is the thing. It's just like you want something to drink, but you know, you're not gonna have a beer or you're not gonna have a soda if you drink soda or whatever it is. Uh, that one that one's got some intrigue uh, because of because of the amount of bubbles. I think it's impossible not to burp too. That's the other thing. You, know, you, you put it down, you're just like, it's good. Something something refreshing about that. Yeah. Anyways, um, I have no idea why we started going here, but we just did and. But it, yeah, I, again, I'll say the same thing. It, it just needs more flavor. The 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 the, the, the Lacroix and the, the the Topo Chicos of the world—they just need more flavor. That's the thing to me. Fair. Have you ever Spindrift. had a, you ever had a ranch water Lubbock's Lubbock's greatest cocktail? I have had oh, a ranch water. Yeah. yeah. What are those? Basically, tequila, lime, and Topo Chico. Okay. Yeah. It's it's good. Those those are tasty. And I was concerned whenever I first like saw the cans because they sell them in cans. And being a Midwesterner, that was not the type of ranch I was thinking of when I saw ranch water. I'm like, this could be horrible. And then I read the fine print. I'm like, oh, oh this is not the kind of ranch water I was thinking. But it's it's hard to find the Hidden Valley Ranch water. Um, that's that's <laughs> limited markets at this point. Yeah, a little coagulation. But do they probably coagulation. exist? Yeah. Vogues, let's talk some football. And you I know to. Aaron had a r- really good story yesterday with Counter Reed and. Uh, bi-weekly is uh, where you can get on top of some other uh, updates from your friends at counter read counter com. But let's focus in zero in here on some recruiting before we talk spring football and Nebraska has been after it. They've been pretty aggressive with who they've been bringing in and they're getting kids to come in on their own dime. What do you think of Matt rule in spring number two with his recruiting approach yeah they've been they've been aggressive um that said i think so this is your like this is your big chance in terms of a coaching regime i think is this recruiting period right now like you get through year one year one goes how it goes um nobody like brass went five and seven as we all know and, but you're still selling like momentum everything's trending up Um, this is going to be the place to be for your future. So you've really got to make, make some hay, I think with this second recruiting cycle, anytime you, you start over under a new head coach and, you know, Nebraska doesn't have the commits yet that some of the others in the big 10 do, but to your point, Chris, they're, they're getting people on campus. They're getting people on campus multiple times, Nebraska being a little bit later in, in terms of the spring game, I think helps with that. Um, to a degree. And I think one other interesting thing about this is, is like Nebraska's out there, it's making some, some big offers, but I don't feel like it's totally, it it doesn't have a home run swing every time they haven't gotten outside of, I think what they do successfully Mm -hmm. in, in terms of recruiting. And that can sometimes be a temptation because you're like, well, this is, this is our time to move. This is our time to go. So let's, let's swing for the fences every time out. Brandon Vogel with us, weekend edition, Hale Varsity Radio, presented by Cornhead Logger. Um, let's switch to running back real quick. Why is Emmett Johnson like the Rodney Dangerfield of the running back room? 
why, why doesn't he get his flowers? Why do people not count him as a bona fide starting back? Maybe because Nebraska had three chances to get one win to be bowl eligible. It didn't. And that was the bulk of kind of his, his time as the featured back. I think that I really think that's kind of a big piece of it is, um, you know, during those games, I remember specifically over the back half of the season, like feeling pretty good about him. Like he runs hard, you know, for a young player, um, seem to have pretty decent vision, you know, which can be the hard thing with, with those younger guys, like the, the holes that they were used to seeing uh, or may have seen as a star high school back close up a lot, a lot more quickly here. Um, so I, I think that, that is, is my best theory because when you go back and, and watch some of, some of what he did specifically, I think he, he had a pretty strong close to the year. He had a strong close strong enough that, you know, you look at him and think, oh, bigger things are ahead for him in, in 2024. I also think it's a little bit of, you know, two guys who have been at Nebraska for a long time now and Ramir Johnson and Gabe Urban aren't really available. Um, you don't know, like, how they factor into the picture. So I think a little bit of the murkiness of the running back room as a whole um, probably probably pulls down, like, enthusiasm for Johnson a little bit, too. And that's a, that's a, oh, sorry, Chris. Real no, quick. No, 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 go for it. And that's a, and that's a, I think that's fair. I think that's probably why it's almost like victim of circumstance in terms of like, it just feels like people, people overlook him, but as a player, how would you, I, I would evaluate him as, I think he's got legitimate breakaway speed. I don't think he's been able to show it quite yet. Um, but I think he really can pull away from guys. Um, and he, he doesn't fumble. And he just, you know, I, I'm not saying I don't think he's necessarily Heisman potential, but he seems like a really quality back that you can build around for a few years. I'm just wondering how you evaluate him as a player. Yeah, I think, I mean, I felt this way about Gabe Irvin like early on too, um, when he was kind of lead back at the start of the year. The issue with him has been just uh, he's he struggled to stay injury free. Um, Emma Johnson, though, beyond that, I think, like, he's the kind of back that they want for this because I agree with you. I think the speed is there, um, even if we didn't get it, get to see it totally um, in 2023. But mostly, like, it it never seemed like too big an ask for him. And at the end of the last year, you know, Nebraska was running the football a ton. It wasn't having a ton of success doing it, but it stuck with it because it knew it was that – that was their their best chance to win versus putting the ball in the air a little bit more often, and, and Emma Johnson was up for it. So, um, you know, we'll we'll see. Like it, it reminds me of like that the early early stage of Amir Abdullah a little bit. It was just like, mm. yeah, the guy the guy's just up for it. I'm not saying he'll be that kind of player. If he becomes that kind of player, then yeah, Nebraska's Nebraska's set for the next three years. But. I got I got hints of that in terms of just like yep give me the ball I'll do what you need. But on yeah. the flip side of things, I think a reason why he might not be anointed yet as the starting running back or or the the guy of the future is like it, it's optically he starts the year down on the depth chart. He's behind guys like I mean two guys that are hurting Ramir Johnson and, and Gabe Irvin. He's behind Anthony Grant who couldn't hold on to the football last year. He's still behind those guys. And he asked the question why. And then he doesn't come in and impress. Like, you have a guy in, in Divina Zigbo back in 2019 who came in and really impressed, and you went, okay, this dude was a, a dude, that, even though he was third string. I don't think you got that kind of impressive, uh, just like wow moment from Emmett Johnson last year. You had some solid moments, but you look at Nebraska going into the portal and going and getting a guy in Dowdell, and it makes you go, okay, is, is the coaching staff not seeing Emmett Johnson as a starting running back? Like, Body-wise, doesn't quite look like a Big Ten running back. I'm not saying that he can't be your starting running back. I just think you were waiting for a guy last year to take that mantle. I'm not sure he took the mantle. He he was the best among the guys they had in that room. But no, he ever had that moment where you said, okay, that's your guy. Hmm. And, and, and yeah, as I think it kind that's... of laid out, he's got yeah, some okay. other... some. I mean, it's not his fault that he's five foot eleven and 180 pounds. Like... Those are things he has to overcome being a guy like that in the Big Ten. Not saying he can't do it. It's just there's things he has to overcome. 
Hmm. Yeah, I think that I think that's all fair. I think you know maybe that's part of the reason too. Uh, I, I got a little bit of Amir Abdullah off of him. You know, his freshman year, he, he came in in a super crowded class, um, and primarily was you know flashed on special teams. And it wasn't until Rex Burkhead, you know, suffered an injury, unfortunately for Nebraska at the time, that it was like okay, you know, he it was kind of he he didn't beat out Rex Burkhead, um, but he ended up. You know, I think he ended up rushing for a thousand yards that that first season. He became their their featured back. So, um, yeah, I think I think I get what you're saying, Elijah. Mm-hmm. Bogues, to kind of put a bow on 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 um, on Johnson, Emmett's a guy that has always been a bit of a an, an underdog, uh, a find, even though he is Mister Football. I think we saw the athleticism as a contestant in the dunk contest that's the thing that rule highlights all the time is his you know his his burst his athleticism i mean the guy's a, a, a specimen as an athlete why i want to go into the why for a moment he had some breakaway runs like i mean rules highlighted the purdue game and help me out here was it maryland it was purdue and maryland where he had two 20 plus yard runs one he took it to the house to seal the deal against Purdue. But when Nebraska got down to it and they're putting a final drive together, they were in the red zone and they were throwing the football, not running the football. Is that a preference thing with sat in the offense or was it a lack of trust in the running back room thing? If you had to speculate and lean one way or the other, that's my question because you've got – presumably better arms slash decision makers now with whoever wins this quarterback race. But when push comes to shove, uh, you still want to just kind of slam it down somebody's throat. I would think uh, in that red zone, you don't want to have to throw the football to to score touchdowns. I don't think in the big 10. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a curious one because you know, and that that might be one where if uh, things have been a little bit different and jo- Emmett Johnson had been a bigger part of things early on, maybe you have a little bit more willingness to be like, let's just let's just smash this thing in if we can um, with a guy who's who's ran, run hard all season. Whereas you know, by the time you get to Maryland, he's still kind of your your guy by by default due to injury. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as we've talked about, I think he was showing a lot of promise there. Um, but it's also, you go back to that, that interception against Maryland. It's almost the exact same play as, as, as against Minnesota to start the season. So, um, which is, which is, you know, kind of fascinating in its own right. Like clearly they thought they had something and he had two different quarterbacks throw kind of two different interceptions on the, on a very similar play. So it might've just been a little like this was here, you know, eight, nine, ten weeks ago, whatever, whatever it was, uh, we're going to go back to it with a different QB, and unfortunately, they got the same result. Yeah, the fur- further you get away from last season and and thinking back to it, you're just like, God, I mean, Nebraska easily should have more wins. It's just, you know, especially being, I'm telling you, the Minnesota game, being in person for that, it was so clear that Nebraska was the more dominant team, at, like player for player, pound for pound absolutely the better team um but god just fumbled the whole damn thing away now <laughs> keep, keep, I mean, take a I mean, long really, drink of your bubbly water it's, relax it's just it's just you know and the same with the colorado game like nebraska was doing pretty well and they finally just ran out of gas late but it's just the fumbles are just absolutely ridiculous like just get it to normal level you don't even need to be great at <laughs> holding on to the ball just serviceable and you probably win three or four more um Staying at the at the running back spot, um, sh- should we have a level of concern there? Only because so it, we just went through Emmett Johnson. He stayed relatively healthy. He seems at the very least dependable. Um, beyond him, Gabe Irvin. Listen, I you know I, this isn't against him, but it's just the guy can't stay on the field. He's been hurt so much. Yeah. R- Ramirez had kind of a similar situation. If Ramirez can be healthy, I think that I think you have a game changer for Nebraska this year. He mentality wise, that guy's exactly what you want. Speed wise, he's exactly what you want. Toughness, all that. Like he's he's love how he plays, but he can't stay on the field. Um, Dowdell is trying to 
make his transition. Quentin Ives just never really got a snap. Is are, are we talking enough about maybe concern at the running back spot? Like as you just kind of tick through who they have available? I, I think so. I think it's dicey. Um, and it's it's been interesting. Rule mentions Quentin Ives a lot. Um, and talks a lot about his talent and ability. Like, I'm not sure exactly what it was that kind of has kept him off the field to this point, because he certainly could have been a guy that, you know, if you were, you want to keep his red shirt, if you would absolutely can. Um, it's just been, it's kind of been a little both sides every, every time I think Ives comes up. Mm-hmm. Um, now he's already red shirted. So it's like, it's, it's go time for him. Dowdell, you know, we'll see. Like, it's been a little bit quiet around him. And, I mean, you just look at – they're running three fields. Like, there are walk-ons that are getting getting a lot, of, a lot of opportunities there, which isn't a bad thing. But the portal opens next week. Uh, running backs hmm. in the spot. It's going to be interesting for Nebraska because they're still going to be – they're still going to have basically two weeks of practice um, when that thing opens to get through. I wouldn't be surprised if, if if running back it's kind of the one spot I go into next week when the portal opens thinking, yeah, I could see Nebraska like poking around here a little bit because I mean, rule told us th- this week, like kind of the breakdown, they want to play three backs, you know, 20 carries mm-hmm. for your top guy, 12 for your, your, your uh, next option. And then presumably that leaves like eight or something like that for, for your third guy. You're going to get injuries there. Like how many guys do you need that are ready to go to get to, yep, we can run, we can run our three backs and, and divvy up the carries we want. Probably mm-hmm. five scholarship guys. Um, so I think Irvin's a key piece of this. I agree with you on Ramir Johnson. Um, Rule was, was pretty effusive about him uh, this week as well. So we'll see. Like it's, it's kind of a, I think, like I said, it's dicey, I think is, is the best way to put it. Well, Brandon, yeah. in an ideal world, the the Matt Rule, Marcus Satterfield, even Glenn Thomas offense, I think uses the run to set up the pass. And my question to you is, if they can't do that, how does that change the 2024 season? If they have to flip it around, if they have to turn to a freshman quarterback and use the pass to open up the run, how does that change what the offense looks like? Obviously, with a lot of question marks about what the offense is even going to be. We don't really know what the Glenn Thomas impact is going to be, but if they are an offense in the big 10 that uses the pass to set up the run, how is that different than an offense that uses the run to set up the pass? Um, I mean, it depends on how, how good that quarterback is. Like, I mean, if you can, if you can complete, complete, you know, short to medium throws on first and second down, which Nebraska wasn't great at a year ago, which is kind of why, especially as you got into big 10 play, I think they kept, you know, handing the ball off. And, and a lot of times it, it felt like chipping away at a cinder block wall, but <laughs> you know, I think it was kind of their best way forward. Um, if you can, if you can open things up a little bit and, and complete some of those passes consistently, if you can be a threat as a thrower at quarterback, which, you know, might be the simplest way to look at what Nebraska didn't totally have last year. And and some of that had to do with injuries at wide receivers too. But, um, you know, if it's, if it's first and 10 and opposing defense is, is facing Nebraska of 2023, like you could load the box up and be like, well, let's, let's make Sims, Harburg or Purdy, whoever happened to be in, you know, make this throw Um, because every defense is going to just live with certain pieces of it. And the quarterbacks Nebraska played last year, I don't think, were consistent enough to just take those pieces of it. So if you've got a quarterback that can do that this year, well, then, yeah, you can. I mean, And I, I think if you, if you have that, um, it doesn't even necessarily diminish the number of carries uh, under the Nebraska offense wants to have. It would just look a lot more efficient, and you, you'd average more than 18 points a game. Hmm. Bogues, uh, let's talk about uh, some of the the development going on, and we hit on this a little bit yesterday. But is in response to to Adam Rittenberg's story on on the time he caught up with Rule this week, and we saw Rittenberg at Thursday's availability. And I wanted to get your take and response on the uh, the advice that that Rule threw out there: treat them all like fourth rounders, <laughs> right? Don't be mad at the first rounder that's playing like a fourth rounder. 
and uh, remember they're uh, they're um, they're they're all fourth rounders. Treat them all the same. Do you like Nebraska's approach with with the the quarterback race this spring? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, rule. I think I've, I've heard him say that someplace else previously. So it's 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 not you know it's something that I think he actually he actually takes to heart uh, because we've heard it multiple times. You know, reading that story, which is pretty brief. I actually thought of I thought of Mark first because uh, one of the things the rule mentioned in there was mm-hmm. was Dylan Riola's ability to stand in there and like. Mm-hmm. Get, <laughs> get roughed up a little bit um, and just kind of talking about how important that is for any quarterback in, in big 10 play. But, you know, Nebraska from the coaching staff on down to when you talk to the players, I think this spring, they've been very careful to like be totally quarterback inclusive. Like they, they're not really going to talk about uh, one guy more than the other. Maybe that's why this Riola piece was so short is because rules just not really going to, not really going to go there a whole lot. Um, so, so we'll see. I mean, it'll be interesting. Like Nebraska has a big scrimmage today. We'll we'll see what what the uh, football football video department chooses to share with us. But I mean, I think I've seen impressive things from from both of the freshmen um, in you know the kind of little snippets we get, which seems kind of silly to to even talk about, but it's what you have. Brandon, as we turn our attention to the scrimmage that's going to be occurring today down at Memorial Stadium. Let's say that Brandon Vogel gets a special all-access pass. You're the only member of the media that gets to come down and watch this scrimmage. If that was the case, what is the number one thing that Brandon Vogel would be trying to glean from this scrimmage? What's the number one piece of information you'd want to come out of with? Ooh, probably the connection relation between relationship you can into it between the quarterbacks and the receivers, which might be kind of hard. You know, they're going to run all three guys in there. Um, goes a little bit, Elijah, to, to your question and point about, Hey, if Nebraska, if we're uncertain about the running running backs and the running back room right now, um, how important is it? Like if the offense has to flip a little bit, um, which, you know, Satterfield said a couple of weeks ago too, they need to be able to throw the ball better um if not more i think it's it's still it's still the biggest nebraska i think is better off is is more talented in the quarterback room right now than it is in the running back room that said it's it's greener um much greener uh well maybe not much it's greener um i still think it's the biggest question it's it's the biggest um kind of missing brick in terms of what how high nebraska's ceiling might be in 2024 what kind of quarterback player you're gonna get offensive line wise i think four of your five starters are locked want to see if you agree and want to get your take on the fifth so if it appears prohaska's got left tackle bennard's got right tackle uh mazuka probably gets right or left guard um and then ben scott at center so that leaves that one guard spot where you got Latovsky, you got uh, Sledge, you have Justin Evans Jenkins. It, you just have options. Corcoran, if he slides in. Any, any idea, do you agree that that's your four of your five? And then who do you think is that fifth? Yeah, I think that those, those four seem pretty good to me. Um, Carol Jackson jumps – might be 1A on that list, and, and Litovsky might be 1B. Those are the first two that come to mind to me. Um, Carol Jackson, I thought, in kind of extreme circumstances, came in, came in and handled himself pretty well for a young player. Um, we've also seen, you know, he I think he's got a pretty good – reputation amongst his teammates which is which is important too particularly on the offensive line so i think those would be the top two for that that fifth starter and then you know you're looking at nebraska i think for the first time in a while you know having some some actual depth there um which which of course is key bugs last thought from you before we get into some counter read stuff uh pretty interesting story with with ad troy dan and an eat what you kill mentality he foresees that that could be a model things shift to in the world of college sports so not only from a big 10 conference standpoint you've got equal revenue distribution 
right now, uh, Ohio State and Michigan, Nebraska, they earn a bunch of money. Uh, Northwestern does not, <laughs> just as an example. And do you think that's the uh, the direction things are moving? I mean, we hear about it with Florida State and Clemson. That's that's why they won out of the ACC. It's not that they hate the league. It's that they hate they make less than a Big 12, fifth place, eighth place team. So do you think that is where things are navigating? Um. I guess I would be, I'd be surprised to see that happen, but not totally. Um, it makes sense in the ACC because Clemson, Florida State are trying to get out, like obviously, um, and part of the way for them to to force force that uh, to the degree that they can. I don't know that they're going to be successful. Is to you know say, well, we need a bigger share of the revenue pie because we're bringing a ton of value. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. When Nebraska went to the Big Ten and kind of that round of conference realignment, it's kind of when we got away from that. It was like, oh, you know, TV's everywhere. Like the Big Ten Network's out there. It's it's a cash cow. Um, let's band together. We can all go, you know, we can all split this revenue equally and, and we'll all make a ton of it. Well, TV has changed a lot since then. Um, I don't, you know, this feels kind of like the high watermark, I think, for – kind of revenue for these these massive tv deals like just with the changes i mean espn's struggling and it doesn't quite know what its future model is etc cetera, etc cetera. like i don't know if we can guarantee that the big 10 and the sec even the two most solid um most marketable properties in college football i don't know that we can guarantee that their next tv deal which is you know i still think like eight nine years away uh is is bigger uh than the previous one and and you always assume that i mean we're kind of seeing it play out with the nba right now uh like are they going to get the money that they used to Mm. get so if that changes then yeah i think you could start to see the ohio states of the world nebraska saying well look uh northwestern is for the next two years playing its home football games on the soccer field uh looks cool and, though looks beautiful uh, yeah it does um but i mean it has real implications like uh i think scott Docterman wrote that story for the athletic talking about you know what that means in terms of in terms of revenue from just splitting the gate um and, and northwestern is going to be at the like the lowest level that you can be at which makes sense they're updating their stadium um so yeah i mean it feels like a big change for where college football has been recently. Um, but if you tell me 10 years from now, that's that's what Nebraska, Ohio State, Michigan, et cetera, are pushing for, I guess I wouldn't be totally shocked. Craig, Craig Moore here is Nebraska – sorry, this is a random question. Nebraska is not going to get a chance to play Northwestern on their, their soccer field, are they? I don't think they have at Northwestern the next two seasons, which is unfortunate. I was kind of hoping for a Hale Varsity Radio boat show from Lake Michigan. I think that would rock. Like on on the boat, we can see the the field. We can see the team warming up from the the shore. I think that would have been a, a great hail varsity show, but it's not going to be possible because Nebraska. Hosts we can we can do a boat show whenever Nebraska plays at Washington because that was popular. Uh, Crane Ack, you were out in Washington, I think, a couple times for Nebraska Washington games back in the day. Yep, and and if Nebraska keeps this Tennessee game. There's uh, the, is it the Tennessee River that's right by? Uh, that's where they tossed the goalposts, wasn't it? After they beat Bama. Okay. Mm, I don't yes, know. I believe so. Yeah. So believe both so. of those, both of those locales, Elijah, you can do barge shows. Mm. There, there are people. I, I'm in Chattanooga. There are people who take take boats from Chattanooga to Knoxville. Like, look that up on a map. It's not short. Um, leave on a Friday, get there Saturday for game day. I haven't found anybody to take me on one of those boats yet, but I definitely want to. Well, we can, can you, uh, we can do that on Salt Creek, 20, couldn't we? For 2034, so we can make it happen. <laughs> well, if I if I had any belief that that game is, is actually going to happen, <laughs> I, I, I'd start poking around, but playing these it ain't gonna happen. teams, they, they ain't playing those games anymore. They're just mm-hmm. not going to. No, I'm, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. we can do that on Salt Creek. Ride the mm. boat from Salt Creek down towards the stadium, the boat show. 
Oh, yeah. Not bad, not bad. Are you allowed to put boats in there? I'm not sure you are. Not you can sure. kayak. Can you? Okay. Kayak a little, show? A little kayak show? Radio kayak show. <laughs> yeah. Do they got some AC outlets on the creek bank? I don't, I'm not sure that they do. No, no, yeah. they, they don't. It's battery only. Hmm. Bogues, what's uh, happening with Counter Reed? What's on the uh, the docket here around the corner? Yeah, continuing to gear up for for uh, spring game, uh, which finally feels a little bit close now. Uh, kind of taking big looks the past couple of weeks at defense and special teams. So I think I'm finally going to rip the Band-Aid off and, and try and make heads or tails of Nebraska's offense for 2024, um, where it needs to get to, um, where it is realistically probably going to shake out. So have one of those coming. And then, of course, I think the big thing next week is, is like once the portal opens, um, it'll be interesting to see uh, with, with Nebraska, I don't think you'll have a ton of activity in terms of departures. Well, practice is still going on, but, but who knows? Um, but I'll be interested from a broad college football perspective to see um, how crazy this go around is um, mm-hmm. and see, see who's hopping in. Folks, appreciate it. And folks can subscribe, correct? How do they do that? Yeah, just head to counterread.com. Uh, we've got a got a about half and half mix of stories that are free and open to everyone. And then uh, some subscriber only stories. So uh, you can head to counterread.com, check it out. Should be able to read a handful of pieces uh, before hopping in. And uh, you can be a free subscriber. You'll just get the the stuff we put out there for free subscribers. And uh, if you you want all of it, uh, we'd love to have paid subscribers join us too. I think you want all of it is what I'm saying. Brandon Vogel at Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter, counterread, counterread.com. Vogel, you take care. Thanks for the time this uh, this weekend. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. There he is. Brandon Topo Vogel. Chico. Topo Chico for Brandon. we got to send uh-huh. him a care package. we got to do that. The Iron Horse joins us. It's uh-huh. Gary Sharp time. Sharpie, what's the weekend look like? How are you? What's up, brother? <laughs> Gary, fresh off of a helium binge. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, think, I think looking at looking at the three of your reaction, I think Elijah might be the only one to get it. Special well, plays, what, special players, special moments. <laughs> what what are we? Uh, okay, oh, so, they're so old. Look at them. <laughs> look at, I mean, they're so old. Quote end quote. So on TikTok, uh, he's been playing Madden for a while. There's a kid named Sketch. And that's his, what's up, brother? And it's uh, special teams, special players, special plays. Tuesday, Tuesday. <laughs> oh, this all makes sense now. My 11U team is saying that stuff all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. So I want You're you playing today, on Tuesday. They're all like, Tuesday. I'm like, yeah, congratulations, kids. You know what Mark, means. this is what you need to do to, uh, uh, to every kid go, what's up, brother? Oh, they're all doing that. Like, what's up, brother? Like, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a whole thing, man. It's all from one guy. Yes. Okay. I don't okay. quite this... get it. I'll be honest. It's the oldest I've felt whenever I see an internet phenomenon. I'm like, I don't quite get why everybody thinks this is so funny, but the kids today think it's funny, I guess. So our our forty year old trapped in an eleven year old's body hit a double and then when he was on second, he he was doing the thing, you know. <laughs> and you're like, okay. This is all making sense now. All right. Oh yeah. Appreciate appreciate the intel. About these crazy kids these days. Yeah, that's good. That's good, Gary. It's good. Gary, how do you uh, feel about sparkling water? We had a little discussion about that to start the day. Uh, I'm not a fan. No? It doesn't go down as well. No. No kinds? Plain um, flavored? You know what? Uh, what is the uh, – what's the popular – you can get it in like a 12-pack. LaCroix? Uh, LaCroix. I, that's, the, that's the first one I tried, and it just – like, I don't like champagne because mm. of the taste, and it felt, like, it, it felt like I was drinking champagne. Now, so Brandon I did, I did, pronounced it LaCroix. By the way, well, which is probably the correct. No, I, it's it's some like river in Wisconsin, isn't it named after? That's actually pronounced like it's like named after a French river, but the Americans came in and bastardized it and call it Lacroix. I think <laughs> in in the state of Wisconsin, yeah. it's something like that. That makes sense. Mm. Look into there's, that one. There's Lacrosse, Wisconsin. You might be thinking of that. <laughs> uh, the ah. the the Saint Croix River. Uh, think, something like that. Qua. I, Qua. Get some culture, bro. Get some culture. It's Qua. 
Oh, that was a good conversation. Smitty yeah. just left. <laughs> yeah, no, just okay, well, while he's gone, he would have started with football. We can start baseball, right? A few ooh, baseball ooh, games. Ooh, ooh, okay, ooh. Nebraska's on a three-game skid right now. Uh, I look at it, I'm not super concerned. And just to rewind, 9-3 loss to Ohio State, 13-11 to loss to Kansas, 7-6 to loss to Rutgers, right? So that's your Sunday, Tuesday, Friday situation. Last two super close games, you know, I, 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 are your your level of concern? Do, do, do you feel like Nebraska is starting to enter a tailspin, or do you feel like it's sort of a blip? Uh, can I answer that question on Sunday night? Because no. it is about winning no, series. No, because I, the show's on right now. Well, you have to answer so right now. I, I said this, yeah. you know, after they lost to KU in that kind of game, um, where the offense has been a little inconsistent of late. I said, man. We'll kind of we'll kind of put a tipping point on this team. Like they've they've got midway through the season, looks like an NCAA team. Schmidt's very concerned about what's going on in his house right now. Mm-hmm. This little uh, bastard over here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hey, ni- ni- nice digs. Um, but like Will after the game on Tuesday night, Lawrence was you know I mean he kind of challenged his team, and yesterday was a brutal loss. Now, they've lost three in a row. It's a long season, and it's all about winning series and how do they bounce back today and what do they do on Sunday. But, gosh, you're up 6-2. You feel like you got a chance to close this out. You're still searching for that quad one win, and then you just blow it. And a place where it used to be your strength now concerns me, Mark, is the back end of the bullpen. Uh, Yeah, I wanted to kind of go there. Uh, Do you feel like maybe – up to this point of the season, they've been trying a lot of guys. There's a lot of arms that they've thrown this year. Yeah. And they'll start to narrow it down. Because I think of guys like Worthley, I kind of feel like he's earned a, a, a more frequent spot in the rotation. Do you think they'll maybe start to narrow down that bullpen a little bit? Um, might upset some guys, but I think at this point you sort of have to, don't you? Yeah, I think you would have anyhow, regardless of how you're playing. Um because you're not going to have as many opportunities to play games and pitch a lot of guys throughout the course of the season. I mean, I just think Rob, R- Rob's got to figure it out with the back end of that bullpen of which guy he trusts and how long he uses them. Um, because you, you know, you're getting an effort out of Brett Sears. Now you're going to ask McConaughey to be great today. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, that was a brutal loss last night. And how do you get out of this? What you don't want to turn into a tailspin because I think today becomes one of the most important games of the season and then when you get through this series, you come home and Tuesday night you play Creighton. And then next week you have, what, Maryland? So mm-hmm. it's kind of that weird mm-hmm. part right now with Nebraska is they're good, but how good are they? And, you know, Will said we haven't reached our peak yet. Well, yesterday was not a, not a good start to that series, but it matters in the response today how they come out and play. Yeah. Sharpie, what I want to ask you about Kyle Perry, and this isn't yeah. – to circle he's he's come in and, and performed pretty well and he's an elder statesman he's a 6 year guy and just won the third yesterday three uh three earned runs three hits uh three runs excuse me two hits i mean he's a guy that you bring in and it's a comfortable situation and he just and he kp be the first to tell you he he expects more as well but he just didn't get the job done is that a ongoing concern from a consistency thing you worry about with him or is it just so uh, just a bad night um there is bad nights but there is i i think all of those guys i'm going to group all of them in the bullpen they've just yeah. been inconsistent you know they haven't have found a guy that's come in there and yeah. just been lights out that has gotten out after out after out yeah. or what they were doing earlier in this year they were stringing together performances out of the bullpen during the course of a game. And it was almost like it was a baton that one guy was handing it off to the other and the other guy picked it up and they just kept moving, you know, moving along. They're, they're having some rough outings out of the bullpen right now. And yeah. I don't know that they really have a guy on the staff as a starter. You go, Hey, you guys know we're struggling in the back end. We're going to need an extra inning out of you. Well, I think there's some guys that their max is six innings if they're not named Brett Sears. And so you're going to ask that bullpen to be good. I just think today is one of those days where, gosh, you almost need the offense to put up a big crooked number where you'd Mm -hmm. feel a lot better and you don't have to worry about that. And you can let those guys from last night just kind of relax a little bit. But 
you know, they need a full team effort. I just, man, when you're up six, two and you're on the road and you got to find a way to close that out, there is no excuses. And it gets well, back it, to something Gary, yeah. that I said this week on our episode of the average Joe sports show, which encourage you to check that out. Uh, we added Gary Sharp to the rotation this week. So Gary, the newest co-host of the average Joe sports show, encourage you to check that out. Spotify. Thanks for the invite. Apple podcasts. <laughs> YouTube. Continue. Mark, well, we'll send you, you, we'll send you the link to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in the comments. <laughs> Talking about farting and, and bubble water. <laughs> yeah, uh, Br- Brennan chimes in there. I'm, we're not going to let the conversation get derailed. Again. Yeah. Um, but it, it gets back to something I said where what Nebraska really lacks in the bullpen is a guy that you can trust to go get you six outs or nine outs when you really need it. Last night felt like a game where you really needed a guy to come in after Sears gets yanked in the six to go get you six outs. And there's not a single guy like that in the Husker baseball bullpen. And from what was uh, in the beginning of the year, a passing of the baton, it felt like in the bullpen at the end of, of close games where you, it went from one guy performing to another. Now it feels like when you have to turn to four guys in the bullpen to go get you through the ninth inning, it feels like now it's just odds wise. One of these guys is going to come in and have a bad performance. I still think Nebraska needs a guy that can go get them six outs nine outs when you really need it that's what they lack and that's a, a tough valuable commodity to go find in your bullpen it's it's not an easy thing for many teams yep. in the the country to go have that but if nebraska had that i feel like we'd be talking about this team a little bit differently i agree mm, now listen perry before last night had been okay like mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's not like he's been great but he was he's been good right um you know he batters are only 213 against him he had a three ERA, you know, he's, he's been okay. Um, I think it's a tough night, right? You know, he's third of an inning gives up three hits. But I I think last night is indicative though, of that, what I'm saying where right now, where it feels like you have to go to three or four different guys to get you through the ninth Mm -hmm. after you pull the starter. That's kind of what I'm saying with, yeah, you have a lot of guys there, but I feel like the odds are increasing every single time you pull somebody and throw in another bullpen arm of somebody having a bad outing. That's, I think, kind of representative of the, the issues we're having in the bullpen is, yeah, Kyle Perry wasn't a guy that gave you all issues all season long, but when you have to turn to four different guys to get you from the sixth to the ninth, you're just increasing the odds of one of those guys having an off night. Yeah, so it's kind of like you need a setup, or a setup guy and a closer. And, yeah. they're, and yeah. they're, like, who, who's going who's gonna to really take that mantle? And they've kind of been served. I feel like Worthley is one of those dudes. I think you kind of pick, pick or choose. Where do you want to mm-hmm. put him? But I, I think he's solidified, and it's maybe just that third arm that you're trying to figure out. Well, I can tell you the one thing that uh, I know about Rob is he will roll those guys back out there. He mm-hmm. won't let them sit and think about, yep. you know. They, 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 they built the mentality of, okay, we had an off night. We're not going to let it beat us again. So today is – Today is one of those really curious things. I, I think this is a – again, I think they're a good baseball team. Today, how they handle things will be very interesting to me of, like if they're in a tight game again, who do they? Who first do they go to in the bullpen and how do they manage that? Because he's not going to let guys sit and stew and go, oh, woe is me. He's going to be like, okay, go back out there and prove that I can trust you moving forward. But, boy, they need a good, they need a good starting performance, and I really think they need, they need to put up a big crooked number today to kind of – let everybody digest last night and move on. And then if you win, most importantly, you're in it to win series. And you can mm-hmm. finish the weekend and you go, well, we've won three straight series. Gary Sharps do, with this hey, weekend real edition. Quick, do we go? Okay. Go for it, Mark. What was that? My fault. I might be delayed here a little bit. You're fine. Uh, go. McConaughey. Do we go McConaughey, Christo, or Walsh today? I'm not. I just hadn't seen McConaughey, McConaughey. or McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. Okay, Christo tomorrow or yes. Walsh? Christo tomorrow, and then probably Will Walsh on Tuesday against Creighton. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay, got it. Sharp, you going to jump into some football recruiting and uh, get your thoughts on where things are at for Nebraska. I know. They're uh, trying to add to 2025. They uh, have uh, not as many commitments as some other teams. That's okay. They uh, have had so many different visitors. Uh, I'm interested here in just kind of the uh, the uptick and the continued uptick in in Metro talent that you're you're close to, and uh, just what you see pipeline wise. Not only some of the Omaha Central projects, or I should say prospects, but. Uh, Kristen Jones is on everyone's radar. 
Uh, you, you just have a, a really good field. Do you agree uh, from, from the Metro right now uh, with Nebraska where they're at in the conversation uh, with Metro kids? Yes, um, and I will tell you because they have a network here in Omaha of former players that are coaching or people that live here in the Metro that are helping them and rules taking advantage of that network. Um, they're, they're very well received here in the Metro because they're getting in earlier on kids and they're following up. Like, you know, like some guys that have gotten away – they offered him a scholarship and then really didn't follow up. Mm -hmm. And I think if Nebraska offers a Metro kid a scholarship, they really, really believe in him and they're going to recruit him. Doesn't mean they're going to get him, but that's who, you know, they want. And so I think they've also done a good job of opening up the door. You know, Matt rule is pretty transparent and he wants, he wants coaches and players, especially from the Metro to come down and watch practice. And so you've seen a lot of guys on the sidelines that, you know, are from Millard North or Omaha central or, or Millard South, wherever they may be. So they've identified the right prospects. You know, Christian Jones is a guy that is a must-get. I think he's one of the biggest must-gets uh, in the state of Nebraska in a while, just because of what he does. You know, if, he, if he's going to be a pass rusher, we always talk about, wow, Matt, Matt where's Nebraska going to get the next Randy Gregory? And I'm not saying Christian Jones is the next Randy Gregory, but that skill set and that speed, you don't find that very often in the state of Nebraska. And that guy's in your backyard. And they've done a good job recruiting him, but a lot of people want his skill set. And so, you know, Nebraska is going to have to play it smartly and work the process and show them that, hey, you can do this in our system. Um, the other thing about recruiting in the Metro is it's not only making early offers, it is being visible. So you see a lot of coaches in the Metro, and Matt Rule is going to do a youth football camp at Omaha Central the first Saturday in May. Hmm. I mean, Good for him, they, do all, they do all those camps in June in Lincoln, but Matt Rule is coming to Omaha to do a camp in an inner city school. It's wow. not for high school kids. It's not for prospects. It's for youth. That also goes a long way. And also they've established some really good relationships with the coaches around this area and the seven on seven quote coaches as mm -hmm. well. That's big. That's brilliant. I mean, your yeah. heart's in the right place to, to do it, but the uh, the fact that he's there and it doesn't hurt that there's some really dare I say uh, up and coming just massive talent levels of up and coming players. Would you agree, Gary? I mean, there's yeah. there's another wave of of, yeah. of uh, Metro talent that some of us haven't seen on the field yet. Well, you know, and and, and I'm just focused on Omaha, and I know the the the, yeah. the talent across the state has gotten better and it's getting deeper, but in Omaha. It's almost become it's a year-round thing to play football, you know, whether you're playing outside or inside. And here in this town, the seven-on-seven seven is taken off. Abdul Muhammad is kind of leading the charge. So you're going to see more and more Omaha Central products that are being looked at by Nebraska and other schools. But it's become a year-round thing in Omaha to play football. Hmm. That's big. Gary, whenever you look at the, the future of, of Nebraska's recruiting, especially in-state, the outreach is big, but how important is it to, to turn 2024 into a winning season in terms of the recruiting in your, your eyes? Yeah, I think that's important for everybody. I also think it's important, guys, that I, I, I live here, so I know these guys and I do high school football on Thursdays and Fridays, so I see a lot of these players. It's also important for Omaha kids to go to Nebraska and do well because we've gone through a stretch with the city, the state's largest city of about a million people it's been hit or miss if you go down to Lincoln and if those guys do well. We watch them in high school and go, man, that guy was awesome. And then they show up in Nebraska and they disappear. So that's also important, Elijah, not only with the winning, is that the Caleb Bennings of the world and the Nick Henriches of the world, they go to Lincoln and they do well. And they have a good experience and people see a plan. Like, you don't think that if Jalen Lloyd, who, you know, Jalen Lloyd with the younger set is really adored, if Jalen Lloyd continues to play well at Nebraska, there's not another kid in Omaha that has, you know, wants to be the next Jalen Lloyd. That was kind of like when Nebraska was rolling in the 80s and the 90s, and especially at running back with Omaha Central and I back you and the Kenny Clarks all the way to Amon Greens, is young players, which they watched those kids play as high school players, then watched them go to Nebraska, saw them have success, and they're like, I want to be that next guy. So that kind of starts your pipeline. So I also think that's important that Omaha kids go to Lincoln, they play, and they play well. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting here because you look at the past decade, guys from the Metro, 
Look at, nope. at I mean, Easton Stick had more success leaving Nebraska. Yep. Noah Fant, the Johnson brothers from Bellevue West. There's more mm-hmm. of a track record. I mean, mm-hmm. Harrison Phillips, if you go back uh, yep. almost an entire decade, I think that was an entire decade he graduated Millard West. Like, the guys from the Omaha Metro that have left the Omaha Metro, uh, let's add um, uh, Watts as well, who went up to, to Notre Dame and had himself yep. a fantastic Oh, career. geez. The guys yeah. that left yeah. the Omaha Metro, left the state of Nebraska, had more success than the guys that went to Nebraska. And, and that's an important factor. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you need guys, in-state guys, to, to come to you. If you're, if you're going to win that battle to keep guys home, then you, know, you, you, you hope that they produce for you so that they, they can recruit the next kid in Omaha or the next kid in Ainsworth or the next kid at Lincoln Southeast. Yeah, that goes a long way. Uh, I'm glad you brought up uh, X-Man at, at Notre Dame. Yeah, he's a guy that he got away. It probably was better that he did get away and, and leave Omaha. Um, for us to go, man, that kid was a baller. And I love what he's done at Notre Dame. Great mm-hmm. family. Um, but, you know, you're, you're right, Elijah. That's a spot on. Some guys that have left here, and Nebraska's not going to get everybody. And not everybody wants to stay here. I get it. I mean, I left I left a state to go to school at Nebraska. Um, those guys have done pretty well. So now it's time for Nebraska, the in-state guys, to continue to do well and have a good career at Nebraska. And then also, Nebraska needs to get guys in the league. Yeah, yeah. They need, they need to have they need to have next week mean something on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and that's the NFL draft. Yeah. Well, hey, through through a little bit of a stroke of of luck too, and through prioritizing and recruiting, Nebraska's speed they have accumulated speed on the roster. With I mean, you mentioned Lloyd, super track guy, Malachi Coleman, super track guy. Uh, the kid whose name escapes me from Texas that moved to to defense, um, Charles. Charles. Yeah. Uh, well, and there's another one too. The uh, the guy that ran like a ten two uh, glasses. I cannot think of his name. He was primarily track under the radar football recruit. They moved him to defensive back. Well, we um, uh, Bry- Bryce Turner. We talked to his coach. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Bryce Turner. Um, uh, Barney, you know, has got some wheels. Will we actually see that though? Right. Like it's one thing to accumulate all this speed, but I wouldn't say last year when, when you watched the team, you thought, damn, that team's fast. Right. Like you, you didn't, it didn't come across because, you know, maybe those guys didn't know what they're doing. Maybe they weren't on the field at the same time. Do you think we actually see that this year? Do we see a noticeable difference of when you look at Nebraska's offense on the field and you look who they trot out at receiver, you're thinking, damn, those dudes are fast. Yes. You know yeah. why? And they, and we're going to say this guys, especially with wide receivers, Man, they got faster in the offseason. No, they were fast last year. They just didn't have a quarterback that could utilize their, their speed. This is what's going to change that position. If you have big boy arm for the next three years, you got to go find wide receivers that match that arm. It's kind of like the Patrick Mahomes, Tyreek Hill thing. Like okay. Tyreek Hill, would Tyreek Hill be okay with – uh, I'm on top of my head. I can't think of somebody that's got a kind of a weak arm in the NFL. But you have to find wide receivers that can stretch the field. So if if you're going to ask Dylan Raiola seamlessly to throw a 40 yard pass down the field, you got to go find some speed that can go down there and run underneath of it. So Nebraska has kind of since they got here have built essentially at the skill spots wide receiver and DB. They've built a track team, um, and then they also have sneaky football speed. I'm going to give you a guy. Rex Guthrie is a guy that's getting a lot of attention. He may not play a ton this year because he's at a deep position, but he's a guy that you know, was in this class of 2024, came on campus. Um, he's playing defensive back. He's a guy from Colorado. He, he is fast. He's probably got fast football speed. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a balance there, Mark, of guys that have the 10 to 100s and then guys that in football look fast. And you know this, they look faster when they're decisive. And they don't have to think as much. And they can react and they can just go play. And I think that's why you'll also see this Nebraska defense will be faster because they're not going to do a lot of thinking. Okay? They got that part down. They're flying all over the place because of the knowledge that they have from last year where maybe some guys were a little bit slower because they weren't exactly sure what to do. Like a JoJo Doman type, I think he's a good yeah. comp. Like, like he, you're, that's yep. a great – that's spot on yep. because when he made the flip and we already knew that he was fast and we were like, man, is he injured? Is there something? When he got the knowledge of the defense and comfortability at his position, whew, 
he was all over the place. Yep, yep. Playing fast. We'll see if there's any uh, commitments or announcements this weekend. Uh, uh, what a Carson's buddies down this weekend, checking things out uh, and uh, perhaps an official visit. Um, not sure, Sharpie, you can correct me. Jackson Carpenter uh, is a guy that's on the yeah, radar. That's your, for that's your son's friend. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Well, yes, but but I'm saying part of the Nebraska. <laughs> Gary basically just said, "What are you asking me for, bro? Like yeah, you tell me, give us the insight, Smitty." <laughs> no, I, I not the friend part, the the uh, the, the visit part. This I'm going to ask him what he sleeps over tonight. You know, maybe no. just ask him what's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> That's so wrong. That's so wrong. Yeah. You are you buying Saban? Saban was. Wearing his Alabama gear. I like how quickly Smitty moved on. Smitty just moved on from Jackson Carpenter. No, I'm just, I'm just watching Nick Saban here talk about getting chores. The done. life of retirement, doing chores, and then going and playing golf. Sharpie, you think he's talking himself into this retirement thing's okay, or do you actually think he likes being able to take a breath and enjoy his early seventies and not have to? Uh, figure out what unproven kid's going to shake him down for a half million dollars this week. I don't know, guys, man. He looks so comfortable. Doesn't he look happy? Yeah, he looks happy. He looks he looks like he's really enjoying it. Um, I, I think, you know, he, he was prepared for this, and uh, we're going to miss him. But I'm, I'm glad that he's still around. He was funny talking about retirement and chores and playing golf and all that kind of stuff. It's just a wild world that we live in that we're going to – when we turn back around to the next uh, season, you're going to have Kellen DeBoer as the head coach at Alabama and Mark Pope as the head basketball coach at Kentucky. Well, that was how wild. How, how wild was that for Kentucky to uh, get told no as a blue blood as many times? And I think Pope's fine. I mean, he, he's a Kentucky guy and he'll, you know, he, he gets it. But they went after some big names after a monster name moved on from him. Yeah, I, you know, he's – it's kind of like the Mike Riley hire at Nebraska. And and a lot of people will compare Kentucky basketball and Nebraska football because of the passion. Mm-hmm. But we're not maniacs like they are at Kentucky. <laughs> our, our message boards are not as big a dumpster fire as theirs are. Um, don't you guys think like a Mark Pope hire is – there is no in-between. It's either going to be just awful or it's going to be okay, fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the, yeah. we, like the Mike Riley hire was – this is either going to be, oh, my gosh, this is incredible, or it's going to be the result that we got. And I kind of think that with Mark Pope. Um, but I find it curious that there's a lot of coaches and media that are trying to tell the Kentucky fans how to react to Mark Pope because they were, they were given, oh, my gosh, they're pursuing Scott Drew. Oh, my gosh, Dan Hurley. Oh, my gosh, Billy Donovan. And then we get one of our own, and they're like, oh, well, and that's why I think it almost strikes me more like the Callahan hire at Nebraska, where it's you strike out on your top candidate, and you strike out on your number two candidate, and you strike out on your number three candidate, and and Pope feels like even more of a consolation prize than Callahan did, and I say that as somebody who does not remember the, the Callahan coaching search, but it kind of strikes me like that, where it's like, all right, we're going to go get a, a big name. We, we moved on from Solich. It's time to get a big name and reinvigorate this fan base. And it feels like you settle for Callahan just a little bit because, well, it's been 40 days. We got to hire somebody. Kentucky obviously moved faster, but it kind of has the same shades of that to me. Where it's like, well, we got to hire somebody. Mm, I, could I don't be know. Well. I don't know about that, Elijah, because, like, like, the, the, so here's the the balance of an AD hiring a, a coach in a high profile job is, you could say their AD swung for the fences. Kentucky's not for everyone, just like Nebraska's not for everyone. Um, in the Steve Peterson pursuit, like the guys that they were pursuing were not at the top of people's boards. No, they were, they were like available for a reason. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. that whole thing. Like I mean, Zimmer, we just, Wanstead. We were just Houston nut. angry, angry, angry. Now I'll give you another one of this. And I'm curious. I, 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 I talked about this on my show yesterday. So Mark Pope played at Kentucky for Patino, who, <laughs> said he'll donate to the NIL to help Mark Pope, which is bizarro world. <laughs> but, but there is something about the tie to a school that puts you ahead of everybody else. Like if Mark Pope was not a former Kentucky Wildcat, would he have been the fourth guy they would have turned to? 
just like if Frank Solich had no tie to Nebraska or Scott Frost had no tie to Nebraska or Will Bolt had no tie to Nebraska, would they have been the head coach during their respective times? Yeah. I think the tie helped the familiarity and made the hire kind of a no brainer, but no, if, if they're just outside the circle of trust, so to speak, absolutely not. They're not getting the gig. Well, and look at, look at Pope too. I mean, four of his five years of BYU, 20 plus wins NCAA tournament twice. I, and, and you look at what they're probably doing also similar to kind of a, you know, you always hire kind of the opposite. It seems like Whoever, whoever you had before, you know, so Calipari was all flash, all McDonald's Americans, like just acquired the most absolute, the absolute most talent you possibly could and just out talent people. Right. And that leads to all kinds of leadership issues, culture issues and all that. Whereas Pope, one ball, 12 players. yeah, Right. Whereas Pope, I think, is going to be more about substance, yeah. more about team, more about grit. I think Kentucky is going to kind of transform into that sort of team. Um, so in that way, maybe not a bad, maybe not a bad pickup. That is that is so spot on about you always hire the opposite because yep. that's what Sean Eichhorst did. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. I mean, you, Riley and Pelini, that is just unbelievable. Oh man, where's and you, the, and you could say and you could say Trev did the same thing. Hey, he hired, I got a, he a guy that's extremely organized and has speak, a plan. Speaking of hoops, Gary, I have a show idea for you. And uh, for folks that don't know, Gary has a show. He has his own show. On on uh, in the mornings, and I just and think it'd be a like good that. idea. I think it'd be a good idea if there was like a local basketball player or something, and if he was gonna like you know pick between a few schools, uh, you know, to choose where he's gonna transfer to. How did Sparty about, get on the radar? What do you think about that programming idea? Like maybe a Frankie Fiddler? Yeah, come so, on your show on Monday and announce where he's going. So I uh, I spent some time with Frankie earlier this week and. He has been saying for about 10 days, Monday, this Monday, he wanted to make his decision. He's about to turn 21, so he kind of wants to get that out of the way and, and also be fair to coaches that have recruited him. Um, so I said, uh, why don't you do it on my show? And we have a relationship going back to his time at Bellevue West and then the last three years with him being at Omaha. Uh, and so he said, yeah. And I said, I know you don't get up very early in the morning. How about eight? And so he said, yes. Um, He's at Michigan State right now. He's returning today. So he first went to Creighton, then he went to Nebraska, and then he went up to Wisconsin. And Michigan State worked their way into, hey, we want to get you here on an official visit. Just come up and, and take a look. And we all kind of went, whoa. You know, a guy that kind of wants to stay at home. And, and Michigan State isn't really, you know, they're not aggressive in taking transfers. So it must mean they have their eye on Frankie. Um, I know that they've made him a significant NIL offer, um, but there's a guy that's going to come back to school that plays his position. And Frankie wants to go to the NCAA tournament, and he also would like to, to, to start. I mean, mm-hmm. he knows he's not going to probably be a 35 to 38-minute guy like he was at Omaha and maybe not score 20, but, you know, could he be a, a, a 10 and 6 guy for you yeah. uh, in the Big Ten or the Big East or wherever he might play? Um, I, I will be honest with you guys. I don't know what he's going to do. Hmm. Um, and I will tell you that returning to Omaha is still an option. Hmm. Okay. So I, 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 I think he's conflicted a little bit. Um, I'm supposed to talk to him tomorrow. So I, I don't, I don't know what he's going to do. I think it's hmm. uh, clearly up in the air on his decision. Uh, but he has some options, and there's a you know a lot of people that want him uh, to come play for them. But uh, we'll see what he does. I and I and and I don't know. I don't know. You know if if Monday is the decision day or something or another school has come into the mix that has made him, you know, keep his options open. I don't think here's one thing that was asked to me. So William Kyle, uh, his former teammate at Bellevue West, who was at South Dakota State, has locked in a Nebraska official but not till uh, two weeks from now on the spring game. Um, I don't think they're connected. Like okay. if, if William goes to Nebraska, then Frankie will leave it open and he'll go to Nebraska. I think they're separate. Um, you know, the only, the only person that is familiar in this recruiting process of him that has a connection is Chucky Hepburn. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Chucky was pretty aggressive on his visit up to Madison 
on saying, hey, I want to get you here. Uh, I'd love for us to play again. They're best buds. Um, so I, I, other than that, I think, uh, you know, Frankie's got a decision to make. And uh, we'll see when he gets back from Michigan State how that all went. Just how well, unexpected do you think the Michigan State interest was? Because you don't typically release a top four, like, you know, without a team like Michigan State. How unexpected of a, of a late development do you think that was? Uh, I think it was unexpected because, you know, I thought it was gonna, he was going to stay local or Wisconsin. But when Tom Izzo calls you, yeah. I think you go. I think you go. Yeah, okay, you coach. Take that call. <laughs> I'll listen. I would put Tom. Would you all put Tom is if you just think about best coaches, however you want to define it, any sport. Izzo's in my top five, maybe top three. Any sport. He's he's awesome. He's throwback. He communicates. He cares. And it's just, yeah, he never recruited junior, but he's been really cool to junior and mama when they've been to town, just on our, from our family, he's been really awesome. Yeah. And, and from his, a coaching standpoint, he's, he is, he's still one of the, the, the good guys in it. You've had a, just a, a million coaches retire like the Sabans yeah. of the world. All right. He's cut from yeah. that cloth. And his team's like floor effort level is so high. Yeah, <laughs> right. You yeah. just you just never see them like, oh, they're they're a selfish basketball team. They're you know they they don't know what they're doing. No, those dudes are going 100 miles an hour every single year. It's just whether or not they have shooters. It's whether or not they have the skill that they need or the experience. But my goodness, there's a standard of, of how they go about it, yeah. and it's it's impressive. Sharpie yeah. will wind it down, brother. How's the weekend look for you? You uh, it's going to be in the be, 80s. It is. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. It's too bad that uh, we don't have baseball at home today. You can't, be, uh, you can't be going to Haymarket Park, looking at the taps in the concession stand, going, win, win, <laughs> win. Yep. Well, Sharpie, you're in with us. We're in Cranax in, and we're just going to do the nine beer, nine dog, nine inning challenge to christen the, the beer at Haymarket against Maryland. How's that well, sound? Hey, we'll do uh, nine, nine innings of uh, beer and hot dogs. Nine beers, nine hot dogs. My Y'all minutes. are crazy. Why would you want to do that? It's, it's just it's, like, it's, why would you want to do that? that? It's Goggins like. You got to test yourself. It's, that's not what he had in mind. He wants you to run nine miles. Like, he does not want you to eat nine hot dogs, um, especially not the red ones with carcinogens. Probably uh, like, just. Right. I know we've all had thoughts on that. Isn't it wild how quickly that changed? Chris mm-hmm. Kaberick has done a hell of a job in cleaning up messes on aisle four. So, what's up with that, right? Like, um, there was not going to be beer. There was a podcast where Doug Ewald, former essentially CFO for Nebraska, that was just, I, I guess, resigned. Retired. Or retired. Yeah, retired, whatever. Um, saying that he couldn't get a beer deal done at Haymarket Park. He leaves next day, boom, there's beer. And so, like, next weekend, you're going to be able to buy beer at Haymarket Park. At a the the vote happens hours before game one of the series, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I just think... You know, and, and, and Schmitty knows him uh, as living in Lincoln forever. You know, Jim Abel has a special place. And, you know, I, I, think, I think personality's probably gotten in the way. And it, it should not have become public like it did. Mm-hmm. And once it became public, um, somebody from the university reached out to Jim Abel to say, hey, this isn't how we want this to work. Yeah. And so quickly, I, I think you need to give a lot of credit to Chris Kaberick, what he has done in a month, kind of navigating the waters as the interim president um, with an athletic director search and just kind of some things like that. But, geez, if there's anything you guys want passed, just put it on for the Board of Regents on Friday. My gosh. I mean, T.O., Beer, Mike Kemp's uh, going to get the ice named after him, Baxter Arena. The Board of Regents is on a roll. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And all it took was being called out. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think here's here's one thing moving forward um, with relationships is you're going to you're going to take the any any personal feelings out of it and any political feelings out of it. And I think Troy Dannon will just be business. Sure. It makes sense for both sides. Let's get it done instead of you've got a preconceived notion of me. I have a preconceived notion of you. And so we're going to butt heads instead. This makes sense for you. This makes sense for us. Let's come to a, a medium and let's get this done. 
in terms of visibility, give me an AD. I feel like Trev and Moose were both really front of the pack. They were always in the media, always kind of in your face, very present publicly. I course was just often some little dungeon, you know, you never saw the guy, heard from the guy. Give me the average of those two. Give me somebody in the middle. Do you think that's how Dannon's going to be, or do you think he's going to be super out in front, super public? All the no, I, 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 th- I think where he will be super out in front in public is with the NIL in 1890. Okay. Yeah. Of this is a thing that we have to be involved with. Um, you know, they're involved with uh, a great show on Saturday mornings and Monday through Friday, so they're mm-hmm. you know they're out in front. But I think that's where he'll be out in front of the NIL world and how important it is for Nebraska moving forward and the relationship there. But I, I think guys, I think we might, after the last two athletic directors who that was kind of, that's who they wanted to be. I think we'll talk less about the athletic director at Nebraska moving forward. And we'll talk more about the coaches and the players and the results. Good. Good. That would be welcome. Yeah. Sharpie, always appreciate you, brother. We'll uh, rope you in for another episode of the Average Joe Sports Show this upcoming week. And you thanks for the time, right man. Here, right? you know, I know, right and we're and we're and we're gonna we're gonna rope Cranak in too. It'll be a party. Yeah. Hey, yeah. special <laughs> special team, special plays, special players. Yep, I love it. <laughs> what is this there Tuesday? What's up, brother? <laughs> Sharpie, just, you, hey, just Cranak, ahead. just just say hey to your to your son. Just go. Tell me about sketch. All right. All right. We'll get on it. We'll get on it. I appreciate the advice. This is good. Hey, Trying to relate to these kids these days. 20 Saturdays, boys. Is that it? Two, two weeks. It's spring two weeks game. Spring, 20 Saturdays away before the miners of UTEP come to town. And then the following week when Deion Sanders says, we're going to take over your stadium. Mm. I don't know. Hearing when the miners of UTEP comes to town just doesn't sound right. That sounds... What even Ooh. sounds worse is is Coach Prime say we coming. By the and, way, uh, the uh, the five thousand Buff fans that make their way east. By the way, does that Colorado game decibel level does it does it equal or come close to Oregon twenty sixteen Miami twenty fourteen? It's going to be twenty fourteen Miami. D- does it get that? Yes. I, I think yeah. Nebraska already doesn't like Colorado. You add Dion to the mix, and it changes kind of everything. Yeah. Right? I, uh, yes. Um, also, keep an eye on as we'll start to get closer. You know, like we're about a month away from start times and networks. Um, what network picks up that game? Mm. And is it a night game? I, I think, think- a- ABC would be nuts to not put it at night. Uh, CBS. Oh yes, forgive me. But There's no. But here's here's one thing that I'm hearing is because of the success last year of Peacock, but they didn't have a great slate. That they may have when they go through the pecking order of picking, Peacock may get some some good games this year. <laughs> hmm. Hey, get ready for Nebraska, Colorado on Peacock. But that reminds me to tough. cancel. That reminds me to cancel until I think those bastards still have my six ninety nine a month from that Maryland game. But I think uh, <laughs> that, that, that that week two. Now the week two slate is pretty good in college football. But the Nebraska Colorado game, even though you have two teams that had a losing record last year, it's still appealing enough that the, it, it, I think it'll get a good time slot. That's got to be a big noon kickoff. It's got to be. It's, well, it's got to be. Gotta gonna be. Ge- Dion's going to gesture to the crowd in some way, isn't he? I just picture it now. He, he uh, is going to engage with the crowd. It's got to be. A, we got we to gotta get the buffs on the schedule every week, every year. That's all oh, I'm yeah. saying. Well, with blood yeah. in the water, I say we got we to gotta sacrifice one of those buffaloes at the Pioneers Park Nature Center. Wow. Mm. It's a good luck Whoa. charm. Hey. I, buffalo meat's delicious. Like it is. Let me have some of that. Give me some of that. You froze. Bison. You froze sharp. Um, yeah. okay. one, one final thing here on that. Um, what do you think the line, the opening line, will be? Because that's going to start to come out here in the next couple of weeks. The win total for Colorado is five and a half. Nebraska is seven and a half. Last year, remember when the t- when the lines came out first for that game, Nebraska was an eight and a half point favorite, and by kickoff they were a two and a half point underdog. What do you think the line will be? The look ahead line. For Nebraska, Colorado. Starts minus a half. No. They're all, what did I, you say? 
No. I said 13 and a half. I got Nebraska three and a half. Five and a half. 13 and a half. That's a lot of points. Nah. Five Whoa. and a half. That, that's, five. What it'll, that's what it'll end up being. F- five and a half. And then as it gets closer to game time, it'll get down to like two. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Is this recorded? This is recorded, right? We should recorded. pull this back up in 19, you know, 20, 21 weeks, whatever it is. 13 and a half is Brennan. steep. That Colorado team still has some talent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah these are all steep numbers. Like Travis Hunter didn't leave. Shadur Sanders didn't leave. Well, and, and here's why I think it'll come down too is, I mean, do you really think Nebraska early is going to blow teams out or do you think it's going to take them a minute to – break their teams in or break their new players in, break in the new quarterback. I, they'll probably not show a whole lot, right? I, I think they're going to kind of kind of keep something in the tank for Colorado. Do, do people... So I, I, I don't know that Nebraska's early games before Colorado are going to look overly impressive. But like my, my question is like, and I know Schmidt is backed out. I think he's letting the dogs out or something. Um, do you forget that Colorado won by four touchdowns last year with a roster that's pretty similar to what they're bringing to Lincoln this year? Like, I, I know people are high on Nebraska's development and getting better, but do you forget that Colorado's going to get better too? Like, I, 13 and a half is a crazy number to me. No offense, Schmitty. Well, well we, have, we have done a really good job here of undervaluing Colorado and underselling Colorado going back to 2019, is it? Or 2018? Uh, look, those dudes got scoreboard three years in a row or three games in a row with three different coaches. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you could quit selling them short. I do like the fact that it's in Lincoln, though. I, 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 people really, yeah. I think, underestimate the physical effects of playing on the road in Boulder. Oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a really different level of conditioning. The other guys are used to it. They come back in the fourth pretty routinely. But having it in Lincoln – Gives me a little bit more confidence, I guess. Now, um, now there is, yeah. I, I do find it interesting that uh, Colorado opens up with North Dakota State in Boulder, and the line, which is up at all the books, is 7.5 for Colorado. Doesn't that seem a little bit low with North Dakota State having a brand-new head coach? They're in a little bit of a transition. Only 7.5 against an FCS team. Hmm. Yeah. You know what I just realized, too? I just, I just pulled up the schedule. I, for some reason, I thought Colorado was week three, but it's week two, so it's right after UTEP. Yeah. So you're really, you're really only going to have that one game. With a so you're, you're, likely first-string you know, quarterback? I, 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 can't, I can't have an inflated line on Nebraska's side. Well, and think, think about, it too. Nebraska got to Shadur Sanders eight times last year, right? If, if Sims isn't putting the ball on the carpet, that's a much different game. Nebraska's defense just ran out of gas late, late, in, the, late in the game and just started getting – you know, picked apart. Um, but if you're able to hold on to the ball and all that, Nebraska's pass rush, it appears. There's no in, – the, every indication says it'll improve significantly, and it was pretty good last year. And then Colorado's offensive line still seems like it's going to be porous. I, right? It just, feel, it just feels like Nebraska's really going to be able to get after Sanders uh, and then hold on to the ball. It, you know, I don't know. might be a little lower scoring than – Maybe what we saw last year. Hey, fair to say, I know we've gotten a little extended here, but this just popped in my head about when you were talking about the Colorado game. And I know on the stream, you know, the, the short field that uh, Nebraska gave them. How come there hasn't been more reaction to something that Marcus Satterfield said the other day or last week? Um, well, he said, we're going to throw the ball. We have to be able to throw the ball. But to win a game, you have to throw the ball. Because I was thinking – if you go back to last year, if Nebraska can simply play pitch and catch or complete a third down pass or a big pass, i.e. Maryland, how many games Nebraska would have won if they would have been simply able to throw the ball? Well, this, Minnesota, Colorado, Maryland, Wisconsin, to Michigan football, State, Iowa. If a defense has to worry about you throwing the football, it opens up so much for you in the rushing attack, which I think is almost more what Satterfield means with, like, to be able to win a game, you have to be able to throw the football. It's because if you can't do both well, run the football and throw the football, teams can load up for one or the other, and it really eliminates your ability to go win a football game when a defense knows, oh, third and three, they have to run the ball because they can't throw it. So we can put nine guys in the box, mano y mano, see who wins. Like, I, that's where I think more he's coming from than, like, we are going to go win a football game by throwing the football. See, I think, I, I hey, 
the running back room is a little bit in flux right now because yeah, they don't yeah. have a lot of options in the spring. Yep. And I don't think they're overly enamored with what they've gotten out of spring. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think we'd have a spring where they'd be more excited about the passing game than a running game right now, even though they got to be able to run the football in the fall. It's You know what? It's, it's so hard. You say all this at the expense of sounding like fanboy or being too hyped or whatever, but did you all see some of the practice footage of Riola where he's, he's chilling on the 45. He's just in, you know, normal workout clothes. It wasn't even padded up. He's, he's on the 45 and I swear to God, he's just, it looks like he's just throwing a 10 yarder. It's so relaxed. There's, he's not like getting into the throw missile all the way down to the end zone, right to Malachi from 45 yards away. It just looks so casual to him. <laughs> where I'm like, any of us has to do like a crow hop to get there. But, and this dude is just chilling, just going, think, and it goes 45 yards right on target. And you're just like, my God, I just don't think there's a lot of people on earth that can well, throw it like that. So we, 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 we talked about this a little bit on the Average Joe uh, Sports Show podcast, Mark, is right. Nebraska finally has guys that are quarterbacks that are playing quarterback. Yeah. They don't have athletes that are playing quarterback where no one no one has looked at Dylan Riola or Danny Kalen and said, man, I, you know what? You guys might be able to play running back if this doesn't work out at quarterback. Yeah. What do we do with Adrian even? We said, man, that's kind of an athlete playing quarterback. Nebraska finally has pro-style quarterbacks that that's what they are. They're not dual threat guys. They've been playing quarterback all their life. And that's what they play. And we have seen that at Nebraska where because of the way the offense is geared, you've had more dual threat quarterbacks who are probably better with their legs than their arms. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to start talking about quarterbacks at Nebraska where we talk about their arms ahead of their legs. When was the last time we had that? Tanner Lee? It, and well, but the, the Lee or is, Zach, like, Taylor. That, that, that is Gans. 100% true. But you look, Riola in particular, though, just seems so exceptionally gifted. Arm talent wise, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, it's not even just being a quarterback. It is like there there are NFL dudes that don't have arms like that. Well, like, Mitch, Mitch Sherman did a, a great story um, detailing yes. Riola and the recruitment. And one of the things that they talked about was like one of the things that that um, the Riola family like kind of realized, like, oh, Dylan's not going to be a lineman. Is whenever he was playing middle school baseball, where his Pop time as a catcher, which if you're unfamiliar, it's essentially the time it takes for the, the ball to get down to second base after you, yep. you, you catch it. So catch yep. it, throw it down to second. His pop time rivaled that of like high school varsity baseball players as a middle schooler. Like, and that was kind of one of the, the moments of realization where they're like, oh, no, we don't have a lineman here. We have like a guy with a great arm. We have a, a, an athlete here in our son, Dylan. Like, when you think about that, like as a guy who's umpired middle school baseball, to have a guy – as a catcher at the middle school level that can go rival high school varsity catchers in terms of getting the ball down to second base, really stinking impressive. Hey, well, let's go around the room real quick, and then I know we got to shut this off. They're scrimmaging today. Um, mm -hmm. By the way, Matt Verzal is hooking up the fellas after uh, practice with Pisons. Is he? Out there. Yeah, is Verz. He? yeah, he's been up yeah. since uh, 1 a.m. He's been oh. in the shop since 1 a.m. making pizzas for everybody after, uh, after their scrimmage today. It's supposed to be a long scrimmage, okay? It's three straight Saturdays of scrimmages, with the last one being the spring game, is what if you hear today, and, and no coaches are speaking, nobody's speaking afterwards, so there will be little things that you know trickle out. What's the reaction? Is there more of a reaction if the quarterbacks don't play well or the quarterbacks play really well, young quarterbacks against a really good defense, where they struggle, or young quarterbacks against a really good defense where they thrive? The reaction that will heat up is if these young pups go in against Tony White and perform because they're not supposed to in this first 180-play scrimmage, all three teams, right? Yep. If they go in and, and carve up this defense, you are going to have this, this <laughs> runaway machine of, of hype and all right – you know, uh, if if they are tempered and kind of get taken to school, so to speak, by the, uh, the grizzled old vets on the defensive side of the ball, 
don't panic. They're not supposed to be able to do this this soon against that defense. Period. Mm. That, that's 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 how the wind's going to blow yeah. in my mind. Pr- prediction sure to go wrong. Harburg has the best day out of the three because he has experience, because he will tuck it and run, because all defenses, not just Nebraska's and Tony White's, struggle against dual threat folks. I think they'll be so geared up for legitimate passing attack. And then Harburg will come in. and then, uh, So I think he'll have the best day. It doesn't mean he's going to be the starting quarterback. Dylan Riola is going to be the starting quarterback by the time we get to August. I'm just saying today, this scrimmage, this early on in their careers, Harburg has the best day. And people are like, oh, maybe he's going to keep the job. He's not going to. But he'll have the best day. That's my mm-hmm. prediction. Yeah. I, I think yeah. Riola has the best day. I think there's been a lot out there about Kalen and how he's performed. I think Kalen has a fine day. I think we're going to get the reports out of people saying, oh, in, in the scrimmage when the lights are bright, Dylan Riola shined. That's why I think we're going to be hearing this evening and into tomorrow. Sharpie, what's your guess? I hope the quarterbacks really struggle today. Really? Because I want to see how they react to adversity for the first time. It's been a, it's been a, it's been a good camp. It's been a depth building mm-hmm. camp. You know, rule. I, I, I want somebody to get upset. I want somebody to say, hey, we, did, we, we didn't play up to our standard today. We didn't have a practice that meets the standards. But I want to see the quarterback struggle and because that also tells me that defense is on point. And they, all, they opened up the kitty. They didn't say, hey, we're going to run this defense against you. Because then I want to see how young quarterbacks go to plan B. Because both these guys have had a lot of success in their career. Now they're playing at another level where the speed is picked up and they get thrown a curveball, and they struggle, what do they do the following week? That's kind of what I want to see. But if they do perform very well, man, you're cooking with some peanut oil. Mm-hmm. And you, I, could be, you could be really, really excited about not one but two. Hmm. Yeah. You got three quarterbacks that are all a little bit different and thrive in different three? situations. Why do you keep saying three? <laughs> well, because, of, because of injuries. That's why. I, I, I know it's Fair. I know it's Riola. Fair. You know, it's definitely going to be Riola, but I'm just saying, you know, does he last an actual whole season? We'll see. No, you're right because and, you got to go back to Tanner Lee is the last time Nebraska's had the same starting quarterback for every game. And, and I think it depends. If Riola goes down, if Nebraska's offensive line can provide a clean pocket, and you heard Rule talk about that, that they want to do more of a pro-style, like, cup-shaped pocket. Um, I think Kalen's probably your guy then if Riola goes down, right? I, give Give Kalen a clean pocket, he'll be fine. Um, but if you can't, then I think you go Harburg because then he can make things happen with his feet. Right. Presuming that there's been continual consistency and jumps with his passing. Right. Yeah. I, I I think, I think Nebraska is very lucky to have two true freshman quarterbacks that complement each other pretty well. And our Dylan needs Danny and Danny needs Dylan. Mm -hmm. That's been, that's been one of the bigger developments of camp. And Heinrich is, I think, I think he proved himself to be sort of selfless and team oriented enough that he's probably good for those guys too, and isn't going to be pulling like ridiculous upperclassmen, like you know, cold shoulder stuff. I'm, I'm yeah. sure he's helping. You know, I, honestly, I'm sure there, he's there, like there really high next here for the no. for the upperclassmen hazing. No. So this is what this is what I've learned. They're all good teammates. Yeah, exactly. You know, they all there. There's only one person that can play that position and the mm-hmm. fact that they are good teammates first I think goes a long way in the rest of the roster accepting true freshmen who are in a prime position yeah and Heinrich Heinrich will be a nice curveball to throw at teams this year essentially essentially a wildcat option right and on a couple series here and there you could do jump passes with him <laughs> you know you can you can direct snap to a tailback and have him go out for a pattern like I think he'll still be a weapon in some ways, but it'll be a little bit limited. Yeah, it's too that's, bad. That's but, what I'm here for. I'm here for hey. for Marcus Satterfield cuteness in the red zone. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say red zone. I didn't this say is, red zone. This is also going back to Nebraska finally has quarterbacks that actually are quarterbacks is I think we're also finding out and we will continue to find out Nebraska finally has a true quarterback coach. They thought they had one when Rule first put the staff together before they had to move Marcus Satterfield. And we've gone through some weird quarterback coaches here. You know, I think the, <laughs> I think the, I think the quarterback I think the quarterback position and the running back position at Nebraska has been 
not very well coached for about a decade consistently. There have been some coaches that have been good. Then there's others been, you know, Reggie Davis's. Um, did I just say that? Uh, so I think the quarterback <laughs> position you is going to be really who did, well. Re- who did Reggie coach under? Riley. Who oh, was he? Okay. Yeah. He, he was there. He was there. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Um, so, but they will understand. be they will be better. They 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 have better co- individual coaching than I think they've had in a while. What do you mean they've had some weird <laughs> <laughs> coaches at quarterback? As we, my dear God, share a picture of Mario Verduzco, who uh, looks like he was a long lost member of the Beatles. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and agree with that. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and agree with that. We, well, don't, that we, don't, we, we don't have any stock yeah. footage of Whipple with his shoes off, Cranach. <laughs> oh, God. Good good dude. Interesting dude, though, right? Mario Verduzco is like a funny, interesting he was, guy. Well, he was he was fun, but... but as, well, as you, here's, here's how retrospect, I, you have just god-awful quarterback here's, development. Here's how I judge a quarterback coach. We'd all like to have a Kenny Pickett first-round guy, a Mackenzie Melton, but... Yep. What kind of a coach are you when you don't have that absurd talent? Yes. Yeah. You know, right. like, like I look at Glenn, I, Dylan Riola has been that guy for a long time. I'm judging Glenn Thomas off Danny Kalen. Right. And I tell you, there's a lot to like in the first three weeks of spring camp that, man, all right, look what he's doing with Danny Dimes. Well, what, and what if he can get Harburg to like a sixty percent passer or something? Well, like I, that I by think tweaking I mechanics think, and you know. So they 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 tweaked him a little bit. It's almost like man, Glenn Thomas showed up two years too late for Heinrich Harburg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ability Sharpie. wise, Harburg's got all the measurables you want. But my my gosh, what, are you gonna what? take up that hoodie and show us your number ten jersey? I'm telling you. You you, you listen. He can't listen. because it's hanging up behind him. On the wall. You, 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 look like. at, you, you look at Nebraska last year, who was probably, over the course of the season, your most productive offensive player. I'm just saying. You know, you can say what you want. I know he missed a lot of stuff, but he was probably Nebraska's most productive offensive player from game one to game 12. Got your five wins and knock it on that sixth yep. win door. Well, game, game one to yep. game 10. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true <laughs> but but i mean really you, you think back to like super effective offensive players for nebraska last year you can't come up with many <laughs> yeah. i don't think that says a lot about nebraska 2023 no. period mm-hmm. period yeah. Yeah. sharpie will wind it down appreciate you my man thanks for coming in and thanks we'll, guys uh, check in next time That's thanks the brother Horse, gary sharp elijah herbal mr mark cranack is open for nil deals yeah we'll be back at you on monday at four with hail varsity powered by cornhead lager thanks bubbles